this week on the Back Table Podcast. <laughs> Michael, is that a picture of you from like recent or was that when you were like 12? <laughs> Where? What picture? I think you're in like a white tux. On. You're in a tuxedo. Yeah. Where did that come from? That's, that's probably from a decade ago. Um, yeah, that's not is recent. That, is this like a Doogie Hauser type situation or? Yeah, I mean, it depends. I mean, if you consider, you know, 14 young, then yeah, I'm young. <laughs> uh, but welcome to the Back Table Podcast. Backtable is a resource created by IRs for IRs to connect with your colleagues and learn tips, techniques, and the ins and outs of the devices in your cabinets. Download our free iTunes app to access the podcast, blog posts, videos, and procedure-specific content to help you grow your practice. You can also find our podcast on Spotify. This is Michael Barraza returning as your host. Today, we're tackling a hot topic in our specialty, the OBL, or Outpatient-Based Lab, which is a practice model we're seeing with increasing frequency. Um, Although we're going to spend some time delving into the OBL generally as a practice model, we're going to focus primarily on uterine fibroid embolization, or UFE, in the OBL. Uh, today, we're thrilled to be joined by Dr. Mary Cosentino from Comprehensive Interventional Care Centers in Portland. Mary, it's an honor to have you on here. Thank you for doing this. Thanks for having me. Uh, I think I can safely speak for the majority of our listeners and also thanking you for your consistent contributions to the SAR Connect forums, uh, both on UFE and other topics. And I know I'm not the only one. Uh, whose patients have directly benefited from the technical and clinical pearls you shared on there. Uh, and I told you earlier, I actually once brought a screenshot of your UFE pain regimen into a case, but we'll get into that later. Um, <laughs> Mary, the, the talk you gave last year at SIR on your experience creating and growing your independent IR practice was one of my favorites. Uh, would you mind just starting by sharing some of your story and how you ended up in an OBL? Sure. Well, it's so nice of you to say that. I always, I, I never think anybody ever reads anything or listens to anything I say. <laughs> so it's super nice to hear that this actually has um, been received by the IR community. Um, I, I went to um, medical school at UCLA and I did research with Scott Goodwin just by chance, uh, my fourth year of medical school. And he did the first cases of UFE in the United States. And really, I just was being lazy and doing a radiology research month because I thought like what better way to be at the beach in the sun. So it was just by chance that I got, you know, really interested in UFE at the time. It was not uncovered by, um, it was not covered by insurance uh, companies and it was really in the early stages. I didn't have a lot of awareness of the, of the time, but I just, I really liked how applicable UAE was. I didn't really know about the technical part of it yet because I was just in a research position um, and then that's why I just really latched onto this procedure. I just thought it was really applicable and a great alternative to surgery. Um, so from a public health perspective, I thought it was a good thing to be involved in. And then I went into radiology to go into IR and I was always open to doing other things. I mean, I had young kids and I thought it was a lot easier ways to go about life than be in IR, but I just couldn't stay away from it. And then I decided I, you know, however many years later, 10 years later, whatever it was, I still wanted to pursue excellence in UFE. And so I did a fellowship with Jim Spees and that was an amazing year. And it was at that time in 2009 that I got to watch Jim Spees in his environment at Georgetown. And we had a full clinic um, and it wasn't really anything we spent a whole lot of time thinking was that different. It just made sense. And so I did two clinic days a week as a fellow and we, you know, we rounded on all our patients and all that kind of thing. And um, then when I came back, my first job, I, when I interviewed, I said, this is what I want to do. And I was working for a diagnostic group. And although there was seemingly a lot of support when I interviewed, it's not exactly how it played out. And I mean, I did everything I could. I mean, I was at like the African American health fairs on my on my one day off a month, all alone, <laughs> <laughs> spreading the word. I mean, I look back now, and some of this stuff seems insane, but um, I just did it, and I really still that many years later believed in it. And at that point, you know, then I knew I, kn I knew how to do the procedure, and that was fun too. So I guess I just got lucky. Is that it's a um, something I believe in from a social perspective, a um, public health perspective, and it's a great procedure, fun to do technically. So here I am. I think that, you know, over the years since my first, I had my first hospital-based job, um, and I was 
I was had too many other responsibilities and I couldn't focus on this. So I, at one point, just decided I'm going to do this one way or the other. And at, at one time, I was thinking of just renting an office um, from one of my gynecology friends and just doing it on my own. I mean, it seems, it seems a little insane, but it was just, I just didn't see the other way. And I knew I wanted to do this. I was just always drawn to it. So um, the past eight years, I have been building this. I've really been able to build this UAE practice. For the past seven or six years, I was working with an outpatient diagnostic group. So I had a, a full, you know, I had colleagues, but they were all diagnostic and it was pure outpatient. And that's where I really ramped up the UFE practice. So uh, one thing I was hoping you could clarify, did, you know, when you were um, renting this space from an OBGYN friend, were you, you know, working on this together, you know, with, was she sending you patients or was it just the space that was shared? Well, I didn't actually ever do that. That was my plan. Oh, okay. I, about sorry. seven years ago, I thought when I left my first um, job with the diagnostic group, I was there for two years. So my first job out of fellowship was a very traditional job, hospital-based, um, but a private practice radiology group. Um, and I really did not like that situation. It just, I couldn't do any of the IR I wanted to do. And so I, um, at that time I was trying to figure out what I was going to do. And it got to the point where I said, I don't care if I make any money. I don't, I don't need, you know, I don't care if I never see another paycheck. I am just going to do this. I'm going to rent an office. This is what I'm going to do. But the answer would be to the question, you don't really want to pin, you don't really want to pigeon your whole self to one gynecologist. Sure. So it actually okay. is a bad business decision to rent an office from a gynecologist unless you're renting an office from a major gynecology group. And even then, um, you know, we have some gynecology groups around here that are, you know, 40 or 50 gyn strong. And it's, it's not a good idea, I don't think, to partner so much with um, gynecology. That I'm still toying with. But you really want to be available to all gynecologists. Sure. Uh, so once you decided you were going to uh, make the move from your traditional private practice group, uh, how did you make the transition into uh, outpatient? Was that with the, the outpatient radiology group you're talking about? Yes. So I, now I'm trying to remember back, this was maybe seven years ago. I told the diagnostic group, here's what I want to do. Like I, I will come do veins for you and whatever else you want an IR to do, but I'm going to build a fibroid practice and um, I'm going to do it one way or the other. So why don't I work for you, you know, two days a week, I'll do your veins, you know, but you don't want any part of this fibroid practice. Because coming from my last experience, I already felt like any diagnostic radiologist wasn't going to give me the time to see patients in clinic and, you know, do all the management stuff that has to happen, which is really time consuming. And so they wanted to think about it. And then they came back and they said, well, we do actually want you to do your angiographic, your, your IR practice, all of it underneath us. And I said, well, I don't think you actually really do. And one thing I did at the time was, I mean, I think this is a really important people, important thing for people to do who are making career decisions is I had the luxury of knowing somebody who was in human resources for some pretty big companies around here. And I talked to her about, you know, where things go wrong when you interview and how do you, how do you get on the same page? So for IR and diagnostic, how do we get on the same page about what the value is? And she said really clearly to me, it's not about me proving my value to them it's do the diagnostic radiologists, what is, what do they see as the value of having me? Right. And so that kind of changed the conversation I had with the diagnostic group because they were saying, because I wanted to make sure they saw the value in the UFI practice and, but I wasn't going to prove it to them because I was happy to do it on my own. Sure. And the more I kind of stood back and said, I'm just going to go over here. Don't mind me. I'll be there Monday and Tuesday. I'll do whatever you want. And, and just don't worry about me. And you don't have to pay for me, you know, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. <laughs> and the more I did that, the more they wanted to be a part of the UFE practice, which is kind of interesting in psychology. Yeah. They also had an interest in collaborating with a big oncology group around here. So that's how I ended up doing a lot of biopsies and ports. Um, and so I, we, I really asked them to take their time thinking about whether or not they really wanted to support the UFI practice. And by that, what that meant was that they were going to pay me a salary. I became an employee, like okay. a, you know, an 80% time employee. Um, and then the thing that they did that, was, that 
caused the resulted in the success of the practice was that they totally stood back and let me do whatever I wanted to do. That's great. That's great. Yeah. So I had really, you know, not so great experiences with diagnostic groups and I've had really good ones. I can see, you know, and, and the answer is that they have to stand back and let IR do what IR does. From then to where you are now, um, when did you make the change to the full on OBL? Well, so about two and a half years ago, the diagnostic group, outpatient diagnostic group that I was a part of, they had been around for about 50 years, well established in the community. They merged with a national management company. So it became, you know, from this kind of local diagnostic group to, I would just say, more corporate. The corporation wanted to build an OBL. So I entered into contract negotiations with them and the big points of ownership and, you know, the 200 pages of contracts that go back and forth or employment agreements and all that. And so that took, we, we spent about a year in negotiation. And in that time, I went down to Arizona to look at some Phillips equipment and ran into Joel Rainwater, who basically turned around and said, why don't you be a part of our group? It's a physician owned group. And pretty quickly I signed on with him. And then, so December of last year, I left Epic and built a lab. So I've I've been in the process of building a lab since January. We had to buy the building and deal with permitting and all of that. So I've been in the true outpatient environment for about six weeks. But Is that I've in been, Portland as well? Pardon me? Are you still in Portland? Yes. I am okay. about 12 feet away from my last job. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, I haven't actually moved anywhere in the city. I've never had to move out of town. I mean, that's this is what's crazy about the whole thing is that I've been in Portland since 2002. That's amazing. And despite all these transitions, you know, I haven't had to leave the community that I've built this practice in. That's perfect. That's so awesome. My, uh, my group got... Uh, bought by one of those larger groups as well. And it's been tumultuous to say the least. Um, so since you've made it, you know, into the OBL, what's your experience been like? Oh, it's so amazing. Is it's it really? so easy. I mean, the, the second day I walked out of UFE, my staff handed me a clipboard. I washed my hands and walked into a clinic visit and oh. that whole thing took less than a minute because I was having to go to hospitals. So if I did a UFE, even though the procedure, I mean, I'm down, you know, it takes me, you know, 35 minutes and not always, it can take me longer for sure. But um, most of my cases are about that long, but it would take three hours out of my day, (laughs) um, which means that I'm not coming back to the office. And, you know, even things like a port, I did ports in a surgery center. So in the most efficient system, it was a one and a half to two hour process. It takes me, I, I always, I, for some reason have timed these things over the years, but um, it takes me about 17 minutes to put a port in. So I, the efficiency of an OBL is just can't be matched. And that's awesome. Um, yeah. And plus it's also nice not having to go from one hospital to the next, if you're doing these all over the city. Um, what have been some of the bigger surprises besides how great it is? Oh, wow. Surprises. Well, I think an OBL is a really great thing for someone who's always learning. There's a lot of business. You know, I'm, I have to be really cognizant. Along the way, I've made a lot of decisions, just kind of mindfulness to my own self and my practice and what do I want to be doing. And this, this goes back to having some good luck of having um, the business development person at uh, the Outpatient Imaging Center. She had a lot of, she had a kind of a human resources background. And we would talk about, you know, why didn't things work out in the first group that I was part of? And why, why is some A so easy and B so difficult? And so over the years, you know, it was kind of like having a mini Oprah at my side. And <laughs> um, some things I always, you know, some, some advice that I took away from that is finding your happy place, right? So for me, I'm very cognizant of what my happy place is. And that's in a cath lab with my hands on a catheter doing cases. And you have to be really cognizant of that because the business side of it can take over. And it's okay. interesting and it's fun and it's different and it's um, entrepreneurial. And 
you know, over the last year, I've flown to Canada to look at fab, um, prefab construction and toured the factories. And I've looked at every equipment known to mankind, piece of equipment known to mankind. And you can be really distracted by that because it is really fine. It works the brain in a different way. Um, and then there's the marketing. So you learn all about marketing. You learn all about construction. You learn all about equipment. You learn all about product cost and contracts and, you know, the whole business of medicine. And in when you, when you have a corporation or a hospital behind you, they are all doing all that. Right. You don't even know what insurance products you cover, right, or, or how that works. So um, one fun part of it is that I get to know all that stuff. It also can be an endless job. So I always keep really in mind, you know, what's the, what's the thing that I like to do? So I would say that's a challenge for people who are going into it is you want to be really, really cognizant of how you spend your time. I do believe in hiring good people. They're expensive also. Another challenge is that you're not going to make any money. You know, I haven't really had a salary in a year. So it's for me, the financial part of it, preparing, you can, anyone can do it because, you know, IR make, IRs make enough to um, be prepared for the investment, but it really becomes a startup like you would see a software startup or a device startup or really any other type of startup. And that mentality is very different than the hospital-based IR who is used to making their big salary every year. Right. Um you're talking about just like until you reach like that break even point. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I mean, you know, you're looking at, uh, depending on if you lease or rent, you're looking at buying a building, paying contractors. Um, yeah. And then, and then it can be a very lucrative situation on the other end, but what does that year or two years look like? Right. Um, I don't know about 25% of OBLs close is what I've heard. I find that hard to believe if done correctly. Yeah. Um, because it is a favorable, it's favorable for everything. It's favorable financially. It saves the healthcare system money. It's much easier on the interventional radiologist. Um, so I don't, I don't think anybody loses in an OBL, but you just have to be prepared for it. Yeah. I mean, so if somebody is going into building an OBL, I think the number one thing you want to do is you want to approach this as a startup. So we are used to, I think, um, in general, you know, everybody's different, but we're used to being employees. So we're used to getting a salary and we have lifestyles that, you know, demand a certain level of income. And to have that be um, not so steady, it can be, that's not for everybody. Sure. Um, and so, you know, what I would say is if to anybody who's interested in doing this, start financially planning for it because you're going to be down for a year or two and it's okay because this is how startups go. And then the upswing will come and the payoff will be there. Um, but if to anybody who wants to start an OBL tomorrow, you're looking at 14 to 16 months type time frame at best. So in that time frame, I would say the number one thing is get your financials in order and start saving money. Cause you're going to start writing checks like you would not believe. Um, <laughs> And then it takes, you're going to have, you know, six months to get uh, insurance contracts negotiated. So a lot of people in hospitals don't understand how that works, which is um, that your group bills under your, your group's MPI. When you leave, you have to build on your own MPI, which means you have to renegotiate your contracts um, with every single insurance provider. The value yeah. of being in a group like CIC, one of the many values is that they have people to negotiate these contracts. Because if I call up as an independent person, my my rates are not going to be as good. Right. Um, so there are a bunch of there are a lot of there's a lot of good things about being part of a of a group, um, and it mostly has to do with negotiations and contracts and equipment purchase. So. Um, so you're looking at, you know, like if you walked out of the hospital today and let's say you had saved your money and you'd plan to write all these checks, you have about six months before you're going to have all your contracts in place. Um, so, you know, I was lucky because I made the decision in December when I left Epic um, until when I opened in about October that I was just going to keep a practice going. So I had to make a decision. Do I shut my doors and just disappear and work on building this OBL or do I continue to see patients? And so I rented an office space um, and, 
you know, painted the walls myself. I had an assistant and I had an ultrasound tech and we just bootstrapped it. I mean, I painted the walls. We went down to like the chair outlet place, bought, you know, eight, you know, <laughs> chairs, went to the medical supply, got an exam table, bought, you know, <laughs> leased an ultrasound machine. I mean, we just like bootstrapped this place. And I, I continued to see patients so they still had a practice knowing That's I, awesome. I probably wasn't going to get paid for a lot of the work I did. Um, that's, so, that's awesome. <laughs> kind of yeah, jealous. it wasn't isn't that uh, I was I'm very super impressed. Super awesome not to get paid for the work you do. No, I'm kidding. I just I so what I ended up doing was you know I I wanted what was best for the practice and what was best for patients. So I had some people that I had already seen, you know, that were in the in the queue to be treated, and I wasn't going to not treat them. So that was right. the number one thing. I was committed to any patient that I saw. Number two is I needed something to do. I mean, I get bored. I can get bored really quickly, and it's not generally a good thing. So I needed something to do. And number <laughs> three is I did think in the end it would benefit me to keep that continuity, that referral base, because with a referral base, you can never go away. You can never, ever, ever go away, or you're going to have to get the referring physician back, and that's a lot harder than keeping them. Um, and then we were able to hold, you know, if I did a procedure in February, we didn't have to send out the bill. There's a, there's a certain time frame which you have to build an insurance company mm-hmm. and it's usually 60 days or something like that. So we could hold some of the bills. I don't like that for the patients, but, um, we played with that a little bit, but I base, I essentially see that first, you know, six months as kind of a wash. There were other reasons to do it other than financial income. It's also nice, you know, to just have something to start with when you begin in the OBL, you know, it's just basically, it's like you're just kind of working ahead, uh, kind of help start that process a little earlier. Um, so, I mean, what does your practice look like now? What all are you doing in your OBL? Um, so I have, and, and you hit on a really important topic about starting, when are you going to see your first patient in OBL? I usually tell people six months. Don't be surprised if you don't do any cases wow. in six months. So, you know, you Why have six to months. So long. Because nobody, I don't say nobody, it's different for every person, right? So, you know, everybody has different experiences, but you can't really count on getting sort of income through the door for about six months. So maybe you're doing some procedures earlier because the minute you open your doors, then you got to let people know you're there. And then they actually have to send patients to you. And then patients actually have to show up, hmm. right? And so, you know, especially for kind of elective patient procedures, and we're, we're not talking about, you know, cold legs. We're talking about women right. with fibroids who've been bleeding for two years. You know, they, they may be doing whatever in their lives, and they got the referral, and they show up two to three months later, and then they have to decide if they want the procedure. So this is all this very long process. The other thing is, as much as people are liked in the hospital, they usually do not get referrals from the physicians that they know in the hospital. That's a good and, point. I hadn't thought about that. Yeah. So this is a really common mistake is that, um, and again, everybody's situation is a little bit different. And you know, some people are still tied in. Their OBL is tied into hospitals. And so that's maybe a different situation. But, um, you know, in general, the IRs who were well-liked and were, you know, the GI doctors and the vascular surgeons and everybody you see in the hallway and they like you. And even if they say, oh, yeah, you know, we'll, we'll send patients to you. Once you're gone, you're kind of gone in their mind. And, sure. um, and then locally, our hospitals have their own uh, insurance products. And they're very big on keeping people within their system, even if they don't have their own insurance product. So, you know, if you're, if you're a primary care provider at a hospital system, you're going to be hounded by your administration to send to your own gynecologist, your own IRs. And some of the systems, one of the local systems here is so bad that if they order a referral, on the order, it says my name, Mary Costantino, a non-legacy provider, you know, in big <laughs> capital letters. <laughs> and I am sure someone's sitting on the back end of that screening those, right? And then right. they will go to that gynecologist and say, you know, why are you sending outside of our system? <laughs> so, you know, they... The fax just doesn't make it to the office. <laughs> yeah, no, they they will, they would, they would do those kinds of things for sure. So... You know, for those reasons, you just, I think it's just easier to start fresh, just to not really anticipate on having a whole lot follow you. 
And you'll just be happier in the end. And then if you get a couple things that trickle in from the hospital, you'll be super excited. But you did it. You managed to make that transition with some of your referring doctors. How did you do yeah. that? Yeah. Well, I do. I think by now um, around here, people sort of see guess, me as the UFE person, but I've been at it for yeah, a long time. I've been there for, what did you say, 16 years? Yeah, I've been here since 2002. I didn't finish fellowship until 2009. And then I spent two years kind of in, in a cave. So I'd say 2011, <laughs> you know, was when it started. Well, tell me this, you know, before we get into what your practice looks like now and everything, uh, you brought up an important point, and that's it's marketing, you know, both for your own practice and for your current one. Um, you know, what has worked for you, you know, both for UFE and for other things in, in building your business? Yeah, that's a good question. And I'll start out by saying that marketing myself, like me doing the marketing is one of the least favorite things I do. Like I, I my um, business developer, this woman I've uh, referred to, she, <laughs> so this is a kind of a funny story. In the beginning, when I was at this outpatient imaging center, you know, she looked at me and she said, do you, or she emailed me, do you have any time today? And of course she knew I did because, because my whiteboard was empty. Like every <laughs> single day I had a whiteboard that was empty, empty, empty. I remember getting one patient on the whiteboard and thinking, oh my God, this is amazing. And then slowly and steadily it built, but I had an empty whiteboard for quite a time. And, and I know she knew that, but she, ha- she said, um, I'm going to need you to go to the Nordstrom's. There was a, there was a mall near our place um, there's going to be a lady named Pamela waiting for you. And I said, okay. And so I went over, well, Pamela was the personal shopper who had set up this room for me. And Pamela let me know that I was, I was going to be needing some outfits for some TV appearances. Oh. <laughs> and so that's, so they kind of just did it to me. And the first one, it's really awkward. It's really strange. And you just sort of do it because what else are you going to do? Cause you have to do something. Um, and so I've done all sorts of ads, um, TV ads haven't really worked. I mean, I, different places, I mean, different cities respond, the, the patients respond differently. So I don't actually like the print ad in sort of like the fancier magazines. Okay. Um, so let me think of how, if I'm really asking the question. I've done, I've done basically every type of marketing. I don't like the kind of marketing that I actually have to do. Um, that's any more than meeting physicians. And I don't even really like driving around and meeting physicians, but you have to do it. I like the talks. So this isn't a marketing thing, but I'm part of the gynecology group here. It's called Peace Cog Portland Society of OB and Gynecology. And I'm the only IR or only non-gynecology in the group. And that came out of a place of interest. I mean, way back in the, in the, when I was starting this, I used to go to all the gynonc meetings, any community meetings that were open for physicians, I would go to just to learn, um, and I got to know a lot of people that way. So then they invite, they invite me to do lectures they, every year. I mean, I feel like I could talk about anything of those things. They're happy to have me give any sort of presentations. Um, so I still do the, you know, go out, I go around and meet physicians. Um, I have to stay active in sort of giving talks. When I started to do radial, I did a big presentation on radial. And those things take me hours to do. Um, I don't think there's anything you don't do when you don't have any <laughs> patients. Okay. Uh, so now then just, you know, tell me what all you guys are doing in your lab now. So I have, I think that I have UFE veins and strange things like aneurysms. I still get some strange, you know, fish like massive AV, uh, AVFs or I'm doing a splitic aneurysm coming up, um, renal artery, uh, angioplasty or stenting. I've done those. I do those all radially. Um, I'm working on PAD. So my next area that I want to tackle is PAD. I think it's important. And what happened was I, I sort of feel like I've maximized what I can do with UAE, not in terms of volume, but in terms of being dialed in. Like I don't have any questions about how to build that or what the right. need is. Right. I've been doing it for a long time now, and now I'm ready for a different challenge. And I thought everybody was doing PAD. And the more I learned about what's happening in our local marketplace, I still think there's a need. Um, And 
because of that, I'm excited to start diving down that pathway. And that is just recreating the outreach effort that I did for UAE eight years ago. So what's interesting about this is that once you do something for one procedure, you can easily do it for another procedure. Okay. But you have to believe in it. You have to believe that there's a need and actually really truly believe it, not just believe it because somebody else tells you. <laughs> um, so Mary, focusing on UFE again, uh, you've done them in both the hospital and outpatient settings. How do you think the experience for the patient undergoing the procedure compares between the hospital and the OBL? Well, that's a good question. And I, um, I spent a long time thinking you couldn't really do this in an OBL. I remember way back, I went to an SAR um, panel and it was John Littman and Jim Spees. And I, I love watching those two talk um, because they are just really amazing at what they do. And they have tons of experience. <laughs> and John Littman said, patients love the OBL. You know, they don't, they never complain. And Spees looked at him and said, well, have you asked them? Which is so, so Jim Spees. <laughs> and John Littman said, well, no. And so I thought about that a lot. And so I used to ask patients, were you glad you're in the hospital last night when I would go see him in the morning? And that was the other thing is that I would go in the morning just as a social visit to say, hey, your night went great. See you later. You know, I, I like had the hustle on big time. And um, they would all say they were happy they were in the hospital. So I tried to figure out why they were happy in the hospital. They had, I always had my patients in maternity wards which are great places to be. They're these big rooms, they're private, you know, they're like birthing centers. They have like these great TVs, people bring you dinner, you know, you've got a nice view out the window. So I thought the environment was really quiet and nice. And it also removed the woman from her home environment, which can be chaotic with kids and um, needy husbands or whatever. Totally. <laughs> and so- yeah, I've had patients tell me the same. Yeah, and so I, I have always been really- um, I, I like to know what their home life looks like. I've always cool. done that. Like who's at home? Do you have dogs at home? Do you have cats at home? What are your kids like? And I love it when I meet the husbands cause I can pinpoint them as, Oh, he'll be a great support or he's just going to be annoyed at her that she has <laughs> to be down for a week. And I'm really strict about, you know, telling them she's doing nothing for a week, you know, no, no carpool pickups, no, you know, all these things. I have two kids that are 11 and 13. And I mean, I, I get it from the female's perspective of what we do at home. Not that the guys don't do things, but, um, you know, especially this moms who stay at home just have a lot more responsibility. So I think they liked that. So I, I try to establish that, um, environment for that at home. Um, I have gotten other things like acupuncture and music, and I do all these other things to make the OBL environment really pleasant. It's also very stress-free. They don't have any stress parking. They walk in. It's all familiar faces. They know where they're going. You know, they, they walk in the door. They walk 12 feet, you know, beyond the door. They get their IV. It's, it's all just very gentle. So yeah. um, I think they like that. Well, then what about the experience for the doctor? I mean, how does your approach to the procedure change when you're doing it in the OBL rather than in the hospital? Uh, so I, I ended up having to go to several hospitals because of insurance issues. Like okay. if patients had a certain type of insurance, I'd have to go to hospital A or a certain type of hospital B. So I was going between two hospitals and in two hospitals, you have multiple tax, multiple nurses. It can really take a long time. It takes about a year before people get used to the things you do and if they ever do. <laughs> so you have to be pleasant you have to be patient. You have to willingly wait for an hour or two. You have to accommodate. Um, you have to turn around and say, can, can you open the renegade? And it turns out they're out of them. You have to be very flexible in what equipment you use because you find out as you have access that some order didn't come in or, you know, maybe you have three UAEs that afternoon, but they only have a box of embolic. So I like it because I have there, when you're going, when you're not a hospital IR and you're not there all the time, you're putting out little fires. And I, I have to say I had great hospital experiences. I mean, I, I thought the teams were as good as they could possibly be. Um, 
inevitably, there's always the tech that you love working with, that the, the case is just so stress-free. And once in a while, you'll sense that. You'll have some case that goes quick and easy, and you'll think, why are these so stressful all the time? This is so easy. <laughs> and it's because you're working with a guy who's like one step ahead of you. And usually you're not. And you're having to say, I mean, I literally have said to tax, um, you know, okay, you know, hand me the wire and they hand me like the glide wire, even though I have a micro catheter in it. And I have to say, no, the little wire, can you hand me the little wire? <laughs> you know? And, and you just end up having to do that over, over and over. And you become the person who, I mean, every, the work that you're, you're working 10 times as hard, but that's just natural. So now I'm in the OBL with my one tech who's amazing and it's almost too easy. So <laughs> for the doctor, yeah, it's way easier. Um, I also think that UFE is just, it's not generally a procedure you need multiple IRs or, you know, you need to collaborate with anybody over. Right. No, I'm with you. Um, so uh, what are your strategies, uh, you know, in the OBL, because, you know, you're in a situation there where, you know, barring disaster, I mean, you absolutely need to get these patients home the same day. You don't really have that, that same option of keeping them there overnight. So, you know, what do you do, you know, to ensure that you're going to get them home that day? Yeah. Well, UFE patients, it's always interesting how they respond to UFE. And I've, carefully monitored um, what kind of medications patients have needed um, overnight in the hospital. So we had them at a 23-hour admit um, or 23-hour OBS, and I would generally start the cases around three or four. So part of the reason I kept people in the hospital overnight was because I didn't want them driving home at, you know, 11 p.m. Okay. So once I moved to radial, um, I tried to recreate the outpatient scenario in the okay. hospital, even though they spent the night in the bed. So one thing is start do your cases early. So I would never start a UAE in an OBL at three o'clock. Okay. You know, you start them at seven, wow. eight, nine. Then you always have to have a nurse monitoring. And that nurse's job is to pay close attention to the patient, how they respond um, to medication. So I usually will use some dilated. Um I start them on Oxycontin extended release prior to the mm -hmm. procedure. So they get some narcotic on board um, and they do. And then I use enterotero lidocaine. I think that's really important. So they do really well, actually, for the first about four hours. The challenging part comes between hours five and 10 okay. because they're feeling fine. And then they go home and what's happening. What happens is there can be a gap in their medication. So I just recently went to just saying, you know, take a Percocet every two hours. Okay. Now, I, we're not even going to try to have you judge whether or not you need it because they misjudge. Right. So we can keep the OBL open as long as we need to. If I have a patient who just is really not doing well, then we both stay there. The nurse and okay. I stay there until they're doing well. Um. And we take full responsibility for it. If they need to be admitted for pain control, then I'd admit them. I just, at this point, I can't imagine that their pain would be that bad that we can't yeah. get it under control in an OBL. I did have to come back one night. I had a patient who just, she just, I mean, all hell broke loose. Like she didn't, she was throwing up. She couldn't take a Percocet. It, she was panicking. Um, family was panicking. So the nurse and I just drove in at, you know, nine o'clock at night. We got her settled. We gave her some fluids. Um, she couldn't pee. We put in a Foley. She felt much better. We got her some dilated. We watched her for, you know, a couple hours and she did fine. And she was great by the next, I mean, she, she went home and had no other issues. So we are available to open up our lab should that need to be done. You have to be open to doing all of this stuff because ultimately it's your responsibility. Um. I guess I didn't really think about that, that kind of flexibility to keep it open. I guess it is your office. You stay as long as you want. Um, yeah. And I can use whatever I want in there. I just right. walk in. Exactly. I'm used to the, the more general inflexibility of, of hospitals. Uh, yeah. It's also yeah, nice. there's no, you just have to have a nurse. I mean, that's, this is getting your team on the same page, right? Like, look, we're here for patients for first and foremost. And if that means that, you know, we have to go in for an hour or two at nine o'clock. Now, that's not the goal of an OBL is that you're, I mean, then, then it's like being on call, right? It, so we like to avoid that situation. The other thing is you can have overnight, you know, a lot of the surgery centers have 23 hour um, recovery. You just have to have two people there. So if you're finding oh, you that, what's that? I didn't know that. 
Yeah. So if you're finding you for some reason in your practice, let's say I was doing 10, 10 new fees a day, which I can't imagine I'll ever be doing, but let's just say I am. As long as you have two people, you can keep these places open overnight. And this is what a lot of the um, surgery centers are moving to. Uh, and generally people will hire like a paramedic and a nurse. That's not bad. And of course, yeah, I mean, you, you, if you kept your own staff, you just pay them overtime. Yeah. Or you hire, you just hire a person who yeah. comes in at six. I mean, you can hire whatever you want. Nurses are expensive around here. So, um, you don't necessarily want to hire two nurses. You do have to have two people. And a lot of these rules vary by state. So what is true here is not true in other places. I'm trying to get the organ OBLs uh, working together because in states where there are not a lot of OBLs, we're at the mercy of our medical board making okay. decisions about outpatient procedures, and they're not considering IR. They're just talking about surgery centers. So okay. do you ever do um, nerve blocks, like the superior hypogastric nerve block for any of these patients? Yeah. So over the years, I have looked at everybody, everybody, everybody that I can get my hands on. I've looked at their pain protocols and I've done little mini studies. Me they're, too. They're, you know, like I looked at the fentanyl patch and the hypogastric nerve block and I just, I would do, you know, 12 to 13 patients and see, did I think that made a good difference or not? And, you know, th there's always more to, er to everything. So fentanyl patch, um, I started to get pushback in the hospitals. It was really unusual to order a fentanyl patch. I know in some states it can be very difficult um, to get right now because of the opioid crisis. So um, the OxyContin extended release has to have a pre-auth, and insurance companies almost never pre-auth it. So I just decided I would have patients just pay for it. It's $30. Hypogastric nerve block, I started to do. It took me a little bit to get the, you know, cojones to do it. I have to say I was a little nervous. And so I just started to do it. And um, I thought at first it really worked well. There were some things about it I didn't love, um, especially the big fibroid uterus. You know, you're really going through, right, going right through quite it. a lot of fibroids. The biggest thing, too, is that I think... Um, I learned to create a pocket. Yeah, you know, we go down, hit spine, and then I would create a pocket. There were too many times where I was in, intravascular. Um, and yeah. so I do think that will happen more than you think. I also know somebody who had a complication with it, like an E. coli sepsis, and I'm sure the needle went through bowel. So I kind of thought, I don't know, this is really as safe as we think it is. And it, t it was taking me about 20 minutes, you know, by the time you open the kit and sure. do the case. And um, and it was not billable in the hospital, which, I mean, that's not how I make all my decisions. Um, but it did add, in the beginning, it was took me longer to do that than the embolization. Mm -hmm. And um, the way to bill that, I found out from an anesthesiology friend, is you bill it as a separate procedure for, and you bill it as post-operative pain control. <laughs> but I never <laughs> got organized enough to do that, right? So this is how, when you start these new things, you want to technically see if you can do them, and then you'll learn sort of the business side of it on the other end, and then you have to figure out um, how those worlds come together. So I did the hypogastric nerve blocks for a long time, and I thought they were great. I also started the enterotereal lidocaine around that time. Yeah. And our enterotereal lidocaine to me, like far, far one out. And so I stopped doing the nerve blocks. Okay. Um, one more thing I forgot to ask. Uh, pre and post imaging, um, when you get MRIs, uh, do you get them in your office, like at your, at your lab? I used to get them when I worked at the diagnostic imaging group. I used to get them and it was great. My dream situation was always that a patient can get her MRI and then come see me right after. So MRI right. at 10 o'clock and then appointment at 11. And that is my dream situation for two reasons. One, it's really convenient for a patient. Number two, there's no downtime between the study and me interacting with the patient because patients will start to call. I had my MRI. What are the answers? And then the, you know, one thing that I don't love to do is get on a phone call with a patient about their MRI. Because the picture is worth a thousand words. So now I pretty much always have the patient come back in to take a look at it. It's like, come in, take a look at this. I want you to see what this looks like. Um, because it can make a patient decide they want hysterectomy, which, you know, my goal is to have a happy patient, not to right. do more cases. So okay. if that patient's better for hysterectomy, I want to know that before I do a UA on them. 
Um, and, the, and then the other part of that situation that's nice is I know when they're having their MRI. If you don't have a scanner in your company, then they're going all over, all around having their MRI. And then our staff has to keep track of when they actually have their MRI. What, what imaging equipment do you guys use in your lab? We use a Siemens and a C-arm. I yeah. am mixed on that. We purchased, you know, our group purchased, you get contracts. We, you know, the more you purchase, the less things are. So um, this is what we have right now. We also, we did something really interesting um, with the building. You know, we bought the building in January and once if the decision to buy versus lease, those are, that's a business decision you'll make with the person who has the money and okay. experience. Um, you know, there's this mantra, it's always better to own. I, I, that's sort of my personality. I'm kind of an owner of things. Like I don't lease cars or anything. Um, and because then you get to do what you want to do it, want to do to it. And you also aren't held back by anybody, meaning a landlord, right. if you want to change the building um, or change the landscaping. So this is, I don't like to be, I don't like to be held back. Right. So I went in there and I was like, this landscaping needs to be changed in these ways. And two days later we have somebody doing it. Right. That can't happen when you um, lease a building. So we, um, our basement was turned into the OBL. We divided the addresses so that we could get our OBL open earlier. When you're looking at opening a surgery center, you're looking at, again, like a 16 to 18 week time frame. If you're looking at an OBL, it's a lot less. Our ceilings are not high enough to have um, a fixed unit. Interesting. Yeah. And so I've we knew this going into ever. it. So when you go in, when you're you know, planning on doing this and you find your property, you're going to want to take, you're going to want to have an idea of what equipment you need and you're going to mm-hmm. want to take your your vendor. Um, but in general, it's the same. It has to be 10 fit ceilings and they have to be able to um, withstand a certain amount of weight. And then you have to lead line the walls and you have to get lead doors and all that stuff. All, all new to me. Uh, do you get, <laughs> do you use an injector or do you just do all your injections by hand? Like- um, I, right now I'm doing injector, uh, doing it by hand, but I'm getting an injector after oh, no. my first I just, I did one early on where I didn't think I could see the ovarian arteries as well as I wanted to. And so I'm getting an injector. Um, and, you know, that comes with what kind of contrast are you using? And when you're doing PAD, you probably don't need an injector quite as much if you're doing below the knee stuff. Um, but I just think for the fibroids, you know, I only for the aortogram, which I don't do on every patient. Okay. That was my next question. Okay. Yeah. Here's some important things. Starting an OBL versus UFI. So UFIs, well, we won't talk about that because I'm always available to talk about that whenever. But OBL, things I've learned. Your partners are the most important thing. Your partners and your contracts. So okay. this is like starting any business, right? So right now, IRs who are interested in doing this, I feel like sometimes when we're on panels, we make it seem so easy. Like we just opened these doors and now our life is great, right? But you got to remember there's anywhere between two and four years of work, kind of a second job going into building these things, right? So every vacation I take, I'm on the plane to go visit an OBL. I did, I did a lot of visiting of OBLs. Okay. Um, and I learned, and I still will do that forever. I learn from every single visit I make. Um, contracts are really important. So finding a good contract attorney, not, I would say not a healthcare attorney, Um, and you're entering into a business relationship with people forever. And the reason there are contracts is because if things go bad, you want them, you want it to be clear how a separation is going to exist, or it's not so much about the startup. It's about what happens when things don't work out. Um, and so I think, you know, we have a lot to learn in IRs, physicians about that process, um, especially if you know, our history is just being handed an employment agreement and saying, here's our employment agreement. And maybe we're negotiating for, you know, a 5% salary difference or one less day of call. It's not really about that, those things in your corporate agreements. Um, and, you know, the financing, the financing is really interesting. I've seen it in all different models and this, and certainly what is being, what's out there has evolved. I mean, when I started thinking about OBL, I mean, probably six years ago, uh, the deal for physicians was much different than the deal now. And right now, there are many more people out there being consultants who, you know, will tell you they'll start up your lab and they all have a good sales pitch. So 
be careful. <laughs> <laughs> That's good to know. Yeah. And take your time and think about it. And, you know, it's not for everybody. For the right person, it's the best thing you'll ever do. It's just not for everybody. And being kind of honest about why, why and why you want to do it. For me, I want to be able to run something how I want to run it. I don't want to be held back. I don't want to be you know, stifled. I don't want to be told I can't do things that I know are the right things. And that's, it's that spirit of like freedom and entrepreneurship that yeah. I like. And I also think I'm, I practice good medicine. I never lose sight of that. Medicine's always first. Uh, I think that probably covers about anything. Is there anything else, Mary? Oh, uh, no, that's it, I guess. Oh, here's one small technical point about UFEs and OBL. I, I started in that vein of trying to reduce pain. I started to use PVA and, um, and to decrease the dose to try to go for like a prone vessel appearance. And I thought that was going to really be an awesome thing to do, uh-huh. but I ended up having more failure. So that's, that's still my question is how do you know where the embolization is? Point point? is? Yeah. What's that? Are you talking about the endpoint? Yeah. That's something that I've been struggling with over the last year because I, I used to pretty aggressively embolize people and I, I just like never had tumors not infarcted on follow-up right. and in moving towards the OBL, I started to use a um, less aggressive endpoint. And of course you don't know for at least three months, you know, three to six right. months if this pans out. And unfortunately, you know, there, there were people who clinically did great, but I would say that the um, incomplete infarction rate went up. I would say it was probably 20%, something I'd never had and never seen. Yeah. So I went back and I went back to really aggressively embolizing. I was like, forget I, that, this. That's still how I'm doing them. Uh, are you still using PVA? No. So now I'm mixing it. So, you know, coming out of Jim Spee's lab, it was really clear what we did. You use PVA if it's a right. high flow and you use five to seven and then go to seven to nine. Mm-hmm. Um, so one vial of five to seven on your side and then move to seven to nine. Issues are with seven to nine, I can't get it through the renegade high flows. I haven't for a long time. So I've just been using... Um, and, and it sometimes goes through the prograde, but not well. So I was just using all five to seven. And um, now, I, now I'm now i in the, you know, one vial of five to seven on each side and then followed by PVA. Mary, thank you so much. This has been fantastic. I've, I've learned a ton on this. We really appreciate having you on here. Yeah. Thanks for inviting me. I love what you guys are doing. And I just think it's fun and you're a great podcast to listen to while working out. So thank you. I appreciate that. And thank you for all who listened today. Okay. Take care.